There was a very nice lady, I don't remember her name now, uh, Christine or something, and she sat me down and, you know, she was like, I'm so sorry, you've tested positive. Um, and um, she's like, um, then I started to cry and she's like, okay, I have to, um, I'll just leave you alone. I think she was going to cry as well. Some people are very fortunate they don't have these side effects. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so In March 2011, we held a London screening of an award-winning documentary, Brent Leung's House of Numbers. It questions the science behind the theory that HIV is the cause of AIDS. The film sparked an animated debate, rekindling a controversy that's been rumbling on for years. We're going to take you back 28 years and with the help of some remarkable archive material, reveal the story behind the challenge to the flawed science surrounding AIDS and the consequences of following a misguided hypothesis. I'm about to go in for my first HIV test and I'm a little nervous. Tell me about this sex life. I'm not gay, I'm not a hemophiliac and I've never used intravenous drugs. I had a psychoanalysis. I've been psychoanalyzed for my decision not to take antiretrovirals. I don't know what they call it, but I went to see a lady to determine if I was sane. The consequences of an HIV-positive diagnosis, the stigma combined with the powerful drug regimes, reverberate into a person's future. This was the case with Lindsay Nagel. I was adopted from Romania in 1990, and my mom and my grandma went to Romania to come and get me. So they had spent two months over there to deal with all the adoption and everything. And then I had, in order to come into the United States, I had to get tested for HIV. In Romania, I tested negative, so then everything was fine. I went. I went, we, stayed, we went to the United States, and then in three months of being in the United States, I had to get tested again, and I was tested positive. Lindsay was given the AIDS drug AZT at nine months. She suffered serious side effects. It was unbearable to the point where we wrote to Peter Duisburg after 40 days and nights of this horrible pain. And he wrote back immediately and said, you must take your daughter off the AZT. That is why she's having the pain and all the problems. The mechanism of action of AZT is embarrassingly clear and simple. It is a terminator of DNA synthesis. DNA is the basis for all life on this planet. It's the central molecule in every living cell. The belief is that AIDS is infectious, that it's caused by HIV, and that you can catch HIV from somebody else. But many scientists and researchers disagree. These views have been skillfully suppressed for decades by the prevailing scientific orthodoxy and the mainstream media. We've kept an extensive archive over a period of 28 years, which will demonstrate how dangerously wrong science can be. HIV 
cannot be the cause of AIDS because it doesn't infect enough cells and isn't active enough. It's only found in one out of 8,000 T cells, which are often, not always, lost in AIDS. And they can't be, that loss can't be due to HIV if only one in 8,000 cells are infected. HIV has never been isolated. Its assumption has been postulated only by indirect means. Every single prediction of the HIV theory has failed. Most notably, that HIV AIDS has remained confined to the risk groups and has not spread to produce a heterosexual epidemic. The test claims to be specific for the presence of a, a new virus, something that infects people through sex, something that um, uh, once you're infected, you're, you, there's no cure, you're never going to get rid of it. So it's, if you're told that you're HIV positive, it's a most terrible witch doctor's bone being pointed at you. And often the curse of being told you're HIV positive has killed in itself because people give up and die. We have been told for the last 30 years that an HIV infection is the equivalent to a death sentence. So even if now we know that most people who have tested HIV positive will continue to survive, and most of them in good health for decades, still the perception is it is a death sentence. Is it really possible that the world could have been so misled? There's plenty of evidence historically to demonstrate how science can get things terribly wrong. It took 350 years for Galileo's heresy to be pardoned by the Catholic Church for saying the Earth went round the Sun. For centuries, those viewing the heavens thought we were part of the only existing galaxy, the Milky Way. But in 1924, when Edwin Hubble's powerful telescope came into use, it only took a year for 200 billion galaxies to be identified. In Japan, it took 30 years and teams of lawyers to dismiss in court the idea that a virus was the cause of smon, a blindness and paralysis that by 1971 had affected 11,000 people and caused thousands of deaths. It was more convenient to call it infectious rather than toxic. Then no one could be blamed. It was only when Professor Tadao Tsubaki, in true detective style, tracked the symptoms down and found that this disastrous nerve damage was a toxic reaction caused by a common anti-diarrheal drug that the infectious theory was dropped and the toxic reaction accepted. In the early 1900s, in the southern states of America and in some areas of Europe, where poor families shared a survival diet of maize or polenta, hundreds of thousands of people developed severe skin rashes and dementia. They were imprisoned, thrown off ships or locked in mental asylums for fear that their symptoms were catching. Many died. The condition was called pellagra and, once again, it was not infectious. But poor Dr Joseph Goldberger, who'd noticed that nobody treating these unfortunate pellegrins had become ill, and suggested it was not an infectious condition, but caused by malnutrition, was ridiculed for his views and died before he was vindicated. Five years after his death, it was accepted that pellagra was not infectious, but caused by a vitamin B or niacin deficiency. Play terror is very attractive. In the battle between what's infectious and what's toxic, the infectious hypothesis usually wins. Plague terror keeps people in order and raises enormous amounts of money. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. From the beginning, there were dissenting voices among top scientists, but they were silenced. The most famous and most vilified heretic is Peter Duisberg. For saying HIV is not the cause of AIDS, he was defrocked and defunded. This leading molecular biologist from Berkeley, University of California, elected to the US National Academy of Sciences, having lost his grants for postgraduate students, 
was relegated to teaching undergraduate lab courses. Among those who challenge the virus AIDS hypothesis, there are differing views. Peter Duisberg's position is that HIV is a dormant passenger retrovirus with neither the capacity nor the mechanism with which to cause AIDS. It's, it is dormant all the time. <laughs> it never becomes active. It is dormant to begin with, it's dormant when you die from it, it's dormant when you suffer from it. There's no report in the literature describing the virus ever to be active in a patient, in a, in a human being, only in cell culture. So it's always dormant. <laughs> that is, in fact, one of the paradoxes of the viral hypothesis. There is no parasite that I know of among viruses and bacteria and fungus and anything that is dormant while it's pathogenic. This one is. That's one of the major reasons why I don't believe that this virus is the cause of AIDS. Another leading heresy is from a group of scientists in Perth, Western Australia. Their position is that HIV has never been proven to exist because it's neither been purified nor isolated. Orthodoxy has given the name HIV to certain stretches of genetic material, but the so-called retrovirus HIV has never been obtained directly from a person's blood. The only way that it's detected at present is through indirect markers, principally through antibodies to a set of proteins said to be specific to HIV, but which are in all of us anyway, or endogenous. There is no way to test for HIV. This is because all the tests are based on indirect markers, none of which has been validated by proving that the markers are positive only when the virus is present. If there is such a thing as an AIDS-causing retrovirus, then its unique body parts, that is its proteins, should only be found in HIV-positive individuals and individuals who have AIDS. But this is not the case. All the principal HIV proteins have been found in all manner of cells from healthy human beings who are HIV negative. Uh, there were indications of, of um, proteins present which were taken to be um, representative of HIV and then antibodies were raised to those proteins. But there was never, it was never demonstrated that those antigens, those proteins, really did represent a new virus. There were other reasons that could explain the presence of those proteins in increased amounts in the cultures that the scientists had at the start. And that, that actually that mis misinterpretation lies at the root of the whole problem that has persisted now for the last 25 years. There was a view that was being expressed uh, by people whose scientific credentials you can't question. Uh, I'm not saying that they're necessarily correct, but it seemed to me that there had been a determined effort uh, to exclude their voice, to, to silence it. One of the key factors that these scientists were trying to express was that our antibody profile can become raised for many reasons autoimmune conditions, malnutrition, pathogenic assault from dirty water. Current medical orthodoxy accepts that there are over 70 medical conditions that can raise levels of the so-called HIV antibodies and cause positive results from the test. Conditions like TB, malaria, syphilis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple pregnancies, to name but a few. So what is the test detecting? Is there anything there? Some experts say that what's being found is not a new virus at all. Etienne de Haven maintains that electron microscopy evidence for HIV shows nothing more than defective protein particles or cellular debris. I'm absolutely dismayed to find out that for about 15 years, the essential control of electron microscopy was neglected, completely neglected. And it's only very recently, about two years ago, that two papers came out in which finally electron microscopy was used to verify the presence of virus particles in samples which were for all these 15 years regarded as pure virus. And to my greatest dismay, these pictures were showing practically nothing else but cell debris. 
This brings into question the biggest crime of all, the HIV test. The test has no gold standard to measure against, and results can vary between one commercial test kit and another. Later, we'll reveal the conflicting results of our own survey, findings that have never before been broadcast. But how did it all begin? It began when a group of young gay men in Orange County, California, became very ill. They developed a variety of symptoms, including purple lesions on the skin, called Kaposi sarcoma, swollen lymph glands, and a pneumonia-like condition called PCP, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. At first, the condition was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. It was thought to be caused by recreational drug use, in particular, the use of the highly toxic amyl nitrite, or poppers. Amyl and butyl nitrites, in the kinds of doses that they are used, particularly by gay men, uh, have been shown in various studies to be immunosuppressive. Poppers combine with antibiotics such as penicillin and tetracycline, both in the test tube and in living human beings and animals, to create carcinogens. These may be the cause of Kaposi's sarcoma. At the same time, at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, scientists were looking into causes of immune system defects, and in particular, a low count of immune cells, called CD4 cells. The young men in Orange County all had low CD4 counts, and it was decided by the CDC that they were not a toxic cluster, but an infectious cluster. The wheels of plague terror began to turn, and the US government agency, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, were put on alert. From then on, all research was focused on finding an infectious cause for what became known as AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. But some members of the gay community in New York, like the remarkable Michael Callan, knew this couldn't be right. In a brilliant article in New York Native called We Know Who We Are, he identified gay-related risk behaviour as the cause of the calamitous immune deficiency called AIDS. His doctor, pioneering dissident Joe Sonnebend, supported a multifactorial cause for AIDS. I didn't want to look at my lifestyle, but when I read Dr. Sonnebend's really well-written, well-thought-out, what he did was he strung together a theory about what the cumulative consequences of an abusive lifestyle might be. And I recognized myself in the portrait that he presented. And it suddenly occurred to me the fact that by the age of 26, I'd had hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis non A, non B, herpes simplex 1 and 2, Shigella, endamoeba, histolytica, giardia, syphilis, gonorrhea, nonspecific urethritis, venereal warts, CMV, EBV, and eventually cryptosporidium and AIDS. I simply no longer, once somebody articulated the perspective that the cumul cumulative effect of that might be disastrous for my body, it became impossible for me to pretend that that disease history was irrelevant to the fact that I was sick. The only thing that's new in America, in fact, in the Western world, in terms of health threats, is the dramatically escalating consumption of recreational drugs, which started after the Vietnam War and has increased over 100-fold in the last 10 years alone in the United States. It is a behavioral disease. It's not a contagious disease. It is a disease that is linked to drug abusers, intravenous drug users, or oral drug users, and clinical health risk groups, like recipients of transfusions and hemophiliacs. I know personally now over 260 who have been diagnosed and died. Uh, and all of these people uh, were uh, addicts, alcoholics. I'm not talking necessarily about simple things like just beer or whiskey or, or marijuana or even heroin. I'm, I'm talking about uh, drugs uh, that, uh, like ecstasy, Special K, MDA, uh, and uh, things of uh, every uh, papas. Uh, these types of chemicals that <clears throat> stay in the body and that are not easily detoxified. And if people took a half a dozen of these things in the course of an evening, who knows what the interaction effects are? 
who knows what the long-term effects of any one of them is separately. Because everybody's hearts went out to that community as they were suffering and so many of them died, it's almost like the red ribbon and the belief system that went with it became an icon of compassion. So that if you were a decent person, you labelled yourself with that, that red ribbon, I, I care. And so that was also a factor that when any questions were raised about, about the science behind this, people said, you can't say that, you're a denialist, because it was as if you were inhuman to question a theory that had been adopted and accepted by the gay community and others. Meanwhile, virologists were busy virus hunting in their laboratories around the world, trying to find one that could cause AIDS. On one side of the Atlantic, at the National Institutes of Health, Robert Gallo was working on his family of HTLV retroviruses. On the other side of the Atlantic, at the Pasteur Institute, Luc Montagne was working on a strain he called LAV, cultured from one of his patients. He thought this might be the cause of AIDS and circulated a sample in the customary way to fellow virologists, including Robert Gallo. And here's how the story goes. In 1984, Gallo took out a patent for the HIV test based on his HTLV3 virus. Montagne thought Gallo may have used his LAV virus for the US patent. Seven years later, Gallo did acknowledge in a letter to the journal Nature that the French virus and his own were the same and blamed his error on inadvertent laboratory contamination. However, at the time, an acrimonious lawsuit was set in motion, surrounding the patent for the AIDS test, when the French sued the Americans. Was it accident or theft, as the French lawyers suggested in court? The whole episode appeared so unseemly at a time when people were dying around them that Presidents Chirac and Reagan were drawn in. They shook hands and decided further litigation would be inappropriate. They did a deal, under which patent income from the test and credit for its discovery was to be shared between France and the United States. LAV and HTLV3 were dropped, and it was agreed that the virus was to be called the Human Immune Deficiency Virus, HIV. Health Secretary Margaret Heckler made the announcement to a packed news conference. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. She then introduced the scientist who led the team, Dr. Robert Gallo. On that very day, Robert Gallo took out a patent for HIV. What it all boiled down to in the end was two men in a room deciding what history was. As a historian, that is really offensive. It was Gallo and Montagne sitting together saying, OK, we'll agree that you did this if we can also agree that I did that part of the process. And then they signed an agreement as to what they said had happened. It was not actually what had happened, it was horse trading about what they could agree had happened for political reasons. Not long after that, we came on the scene, a small production company specialising in science and medical stories. A friend of mine, a drama producer called Carol Wiseman, was working with Michael Verney Elliott, also a TV producer. Michael was gay and was sure that gay men were being unjustly blamed for infecting the world with AIDS. So Carol sent him to me and we met at Bertarelli's in Floral Street, Covent Garden, just around the corner from our offices in James Street. I had seen Michael Verney Elliott in the Meditel offices and he'd given us something of a story about um, AIDS and contaminated blood. And we, we, we talked for a long time about this. And I thought it was good enough to at least do a bit of preliminary research. So I got some cash from Channel 4 and went out to the US to see if we could justify this story. Frankly, that story didn't stand up. But while I was there, I came across a copy of the New York Native, and they referred to an article in Cancer Research, written by Duisburg. And I just read through the article. I was bad, bad company, because it was so intellectually challenging. It was such an exciting read. It was remarkable to see a piece of work which so comprehensively and so thoroughly, in such a detailed fashion, 
attacked um, the, the prevailing view. Millions of pounds are being ploughed into the campaign against AIDS. AIDS, the unheard voices, went on to win the Royal Television Society's award for current affairs. We thought we would change the world. Our second dispatches, commissioned again by David Lloyd at Channel 4, went further. It reflected Peter Duesberg's position that not only does HIV not cause AIDS, but that AIDS is not infectious. Duesberg maintains that because HIV is dormant, even if it is transmitted, it cannot be pathogenic or cause harm. I believe that H is not an, or cannot even be an infectious disease. See, an infectious disease, believe it or not, has a certain criteria to it. How it happens, when it happens. For example, if you get infected by a bug or by a virus, within weeks or months after a contact or after that infection, you will have symptoms of a disease. In HIV and AIDS, however, we are told you get sick 10 years later, 10 years after infection. That is not how viruses or bacteria even work. They work fast or never. They are very simple mechanisms, like a little clock, that can do only one thing, go around the dial once, and that takes 24 to 48 hours with the virus. There's no way that virus could possibly slow down or wait a week or wait 10 years. That is totally absurd. From an astonished silence after AIDS, the unheard voices, this program, the AIDS Catch, caused an avalanche of complaints from the scientific establishment. The AIDS barons, working with huge HIV research grants from the Medical Research Council, were not best pleased and aired their complaints in the newspapers that were happy to print them. Channel 4 and our production company were brought before the Broadcasting Complaints Commission and found guilty of being unfair in our treatment of the subject of AIDS. I remember Dispatch's editor David Lloyd saying, it's like winning a football match 9-0 and being told you've lost. And all this time, young men were dying. They were told that if they tested antibody positive to HIV, they would certainly die, and they were given murderously high doses of AZT. None of those on the high doses survived. I think the central fact is that despite five years of AZT and trials and uh, four on the open market, people keep dying in large numbers. And hence, uh, it is clearly not as wonderful a drug or a lifesaver as it is made out. First of all, I think it's self-evident that our study does not provide the kind of benefit that everyone wished for. It can't be a secret that patients wanted something that would help them live longer. Uh, unfortunately, it has not demonstrated that, and therefore this has to be unwelcome news. The effect of AZT on body cells as a whole is very deleterious because it, it prevents cells from replicating. There's a second point in that cells that may survive AZT uh, may themselves become cancerous. So there is a double danger for AZT, AZT the way I see it. John Lauritsen had by now written his seminal articles on AZT in the New York Native and had dug out freedom of information papers pointing to the dishonest and fraudulent use of data from the AZT phase two trials. But the, the, the real horror of this study only became apparent after going through documents which were obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. And it indicated that there had been not sl only sloppiness of every conceivable sort, but that there had been actual cheating in a number of areas uh, it indicated that the study had become unblinded very quickly in the first few weeks, uh, although it was planned as a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. In fact, it was nothing of the kind. Uh, both patients and doctors knew who was getting ACT and who was getting placebo. So shocked were people like Michael Elner, Frank Bernarkus, and Jean Fedorko at the suffering and death they were witnessing around them 
that they formed a health group called Heal New York to help people make their own decisions about AZT. I wouldn't give it to my cats. I, I would think it was murder. Alan Roundtree was another of the young men who came to Heal New York for help. He died not long after this interview. Here he describes what it was like to take AZT. At first, good. Oh boy, I gained weight. And uh, I said, boy, this stuff must be working. And then about another two weeks later, it did start working. The headaches came, the, the dizziness, the noxiousness, and the whole time I had fingernails that were so black, it looked like I had nail polish on, you know? And, and uh, the upset stomachs, nothing tastes right, food or anything. And the main, main, the main thing of it, it affect you so where you couldn't listen to people because you don't want to hear them because you're hurting so bad. And uh, it left me, it left me impudent. It, um, it destroyed my hopes for living, you know. Babies born to HIV-positive mothers were also being given AZT, and a Medical Research Council trial was set in motion across Europe, called the PENTA trial. They test him. They will tell me the results in one month's time, but I'm worried he should be given the AZT treatment, and I need more information about it. In June 2000, at President Thabo Mbeki's gathering of an expert panel on AIDS in Pretoria, South Africa, Dr. Andrew Herxheimer, a world-famous pharmacologist, said... I think, uh, I think Zydovudine was a drug that was never really evaluated properly and that its efficacy has never been proved, but its toxicity certainly is uh, important. And I think it has killed a lot of people, especially at the higher doses. I personally think that it is not worth using alone or in combination at all. One of the key things that people need is they, they want to understand, first of all, what's really going on, um, usually because they've come across something which conflicts with what they've been told by their doctors. Um, the other thing is they want to know how scared should they be, in a way? That's actually quite a critical thing. Um, is their diagnosis really dangerous or not? And is, uh, to know that they're not the only one in the flesh that is questioning this. Because it's one thing to look at a load of information on, on the internet, but it's a completely different matter from actually meeting someone that can coherently argue the same points face to face. In 1992, something extraordinary happened. A conference was organized in Amsterdam called AIDS A Different View, and many members of the Orthodoxy signed up to attend. Joanne Sawicki at Sky News agreed to broadcast a news report from there. It was here that the now Nobel laureate, Dr. Luc Montagne, told the world that you don't necessarily die if you have HIV. We are seeing people which have been infected for 9, 10 years or more, or more, 10, 12 years, and they are still in good shape. Their immune system is still good. And it's in, it is unlikely those people will come down, will come down with AIDS uh, later. Two years before, in 1990, when we'd interviewed Luc Montagne for the AIDS catch, he'd had doubts about HIV being able to do the whole job. He said HIV needed cofactors to do any damage. At first, yes, we thought we had the best, the best candidate uh, this virus, uh, for this virus to be the cause of AIDS. But uh, after a while, even from the beginning actually, we, we thought maybe uh, for the activation of that virus in cells, we, uh, had to, we need some cofactors. So I would agree that HIV by itself, or some strains of HIV, are not sufficient to induce AIDS. 
In 1997, in an interview with filmmaker Jamel Tahi, published in Continuum magazine, Montagne said that HIV had never been purified. Well, of course, we looked for it. We saw some particles, but they didn't have the morphology of retroviruses. He later said... I repeat, we did not purify. It was startling that Professor Montaigne decided to acknowledge in his interview with Jamel Tahi and Continuum that as far back as 1983, his team were not able to purify anything that you might call HIV, despite what he termed a, a, a Roman effort. So who should be surprised that when the same thing was attempted by expert laboratories in Germany and the United States who published their results in the journal of Virology, what they found was proteins and cellular debris. Then in Pretoria, Hugh tackled Luc Montagne on the purification question. Was the uh, first genome taken from purified virus? Well, it, uh, identified with the purified virus. It was not made from purified virus, but it doesn't matter because you clone, you know, oh, <laughs> you clone you DNA, not... once it's cloned, it's pure. So you think it's not necessary to begin with a purified sample? No, not at all. But it's, uh, it's very past techniques. You know, we are now in the world of modern molecular biology and uh, everything has changed. You know? I, I, I can only offer you one thing, which is then it's easy to, to make these people be quiet. Just go back and do the simple purification business that wasn't done. And then they will have to agree. That's what they well, agree. this has been it's done by pharmaceutical company. The first, the first eight steps, the first HIV test was done with purified virus. So what they did is to produce, mass produce a virus and uh, purify it by several, uh, what we call uh, uh, density gradient centrifugation, and you get a burn, and you can look at the electron microscope, you see a lot of other particles. Uh, of course, it's not 100% pure. No material, no biological material is 100% pure. Oh, very close to pure. Though. Very close to but pure. But no one has ever seen those photographs. They've seen it for Rouse, and they've seen it for the, the rest, but never for HIV. Uh, well, we, 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 had picture, we, had, uh, we have made pictures. We didn't publish them because we published the first picture. We could not, you know, uh, when we send other pictures to, to journalists, say, we have, a, we have seen uh, that before. We don't this care. Is how you must win your argument. You just show them the photo. Sorry? You just show them the photograph and then you will win your I argument. I don't have with, with them with me, but, eh, fine, but, uh, you can solve it but uh, oh. this, is, this is very old. Uh, old problem which have been solved for many years. So primary, it's not really an argument. If we don't need to purify anymore, and we don't need to isolate according to the previous conventions of virology, and we don't have a real picture of the retrovirus HIV, then what do we have? Oblivious to these concerns, the great HIV bandwagon rolled on, protecting the growing fortunes of those involved in the manufacture of the test kits, the production of so-called anti-HIV drugs, and HIV research. In the summer of 1992, the Berlin World AIDS Conference provided a huge jamboree. Many dissidents attended, and we penetrated this citadel with renewed energy. I kept a video diary. John Lauritsen arrived from New York today, and the long, hot summer of dissent truly began. He brought a case full of his book, The AIDS War, hot off the press. And using the metaphor of war, saying that the AIDS uh, phenomenon is like a war with the terrible loss of life and suffering, and also profiteering, and propaganda, treachery, espionage, sabotage, and all of the things that we associate with the war. And of course, intense censorship uh, in trying to get out the truth about AIDS. So John and I, together with Hector Gildemeister, a German-born biochemist who works with us, set off for Hanover and Berlin. We work quickly to get our literature into the conference and onto the press racks as soon as possible. Robert Larhoven from the Amsterdam Group had prepared, with the help of Peter Rath, a formidable selection of dossiers. These included the journal Rethinking AIDS, from the Group for the Scientific Re-Evaluation of the HIV-AIDS Hypothesis, a group comprising 150 scientists and researchers, including a Nobel Prize winner. Our efforts were futile. Within hours, all the dossiers in the press lounge were confiscated by the organizers. 
Dr. Robert Gallo was there, accompanied by three bodyguards using strong-arm tactics at what was no more than journalistic exuberance. It was possible for us to confront Robert Gallo and the panel during the press conferences. We decided this was the time to put some important points to Dr. Gallo. Question for Dr. Gallo. Professor Robert Root Bernstein, author of Rethinking AIDS, has said that by the end of the century, we'll know everything there is to know about HIV and nothing about AIDS. Given that all of Professor Peter Duisberg's predictions have come true, namely that there's been no heterosexual spread of AIDS in the Western world and that AZT doesn't work, when will you, Dr. Gallo, agree that we need to fund a total reappraisal of the HIV AIDS hypothesis not dictated to by the search for endless, new, useless, and damaging antivirals. OK, thank you for the statement. Short answer. I, I think uh, Dr. Ruth Bernstein doesn't know what he's talking about. OK. I would like that, a no, no discussion, please. I, Sorry. I, I, Next I, I, question. Up to there. The answer is, the I think he's wrong. And I think any rational person who's looked at this carefully, slowly, and is trained has come to the same conclusion that he's wrong. I don't influence funding. I'm not a director of an institute. I do my work. I'm working on HIV as the cause of this disease. I have since 1984. If you and Ruth Bernstein don't believe it, so be it. Do your own work on what you think the cause is and don't bother me. The battle was on. Ironically, our opponents were gay lobby groups like ACT UP, who'd been brought over as official dissidents, bussed in strategically to protest about a lack of drugs. A group from uh, ACT UP people, they come out of the building from the Congress and uh, they made a demonstration and they give statements against the British government and suddenly uh, uh, some people out of this group come to us and they took our uh, posters and burned them. Peter Schmidt, who'd been filming the goings-on, had been ordered to erase his tapes by one of the German professors. Professor Seichert uh, not only warned uh, uh, his uh, picture uh, delayed, he warned to have the complete cassette. Well, I refused him. I said, no, there's no way. And so we only took out, uh, took out his pictures out of the, uh, from the cassette. And they said that I had to leave on charges of trespassing. They took my press card and two policemen uh, brought me outside the conference hall. And what did they say? Uh, that if I ever crossed this line, for this line, this line, I would be arrested. It became more clear to me that there is a very heavy censorship on dissident information. And I'm not afraid anymore to use words as AIDS fascism. Well, this is the first AIDS conference ever where there's a real presence of honest AIDS dissidents, those of us who are opposed to the basic AIDS paradigm, the HIV AIDS hypothesis, and AZT therapy. At the same time, there have been shocking events at this conference, which means that the people in the AIDS establishment are afraid of free speech. The level of censorship was staggering. Celia Farber, John Lauritsen and Frank Bernarkus were among those who stuck it out to the bitter end. I do get extremely despondent and I've been feeling that. When I walk around here I feel like this is so hopeless. What we are up against is a gargantuan multi-billion dollar infrastructure. And who do we think we are? Who do we think we are kidding? You know, I mean, but you have to just be Sisyphus, right? And keep pushing the, the rock up the hill and let it roll down again. There's no other choice. The only other option is to just turn, turn around and walk away, which we're obviously, we've, we know what we know, so it's too late to do that. I would like to ask a uh, Hover male, are you willing to apologize for the horrible acts of violence that you have condoned and for the acts of censorship for which you personally are responsible? You owe me and many people can you do that, or will you refuse to do so? May I answer shortly? Simply no. Since what you are saying is not the truth. 
At the opening press briefing, Professor Habermill had described people who questioned the role of HIV as mentally disturbed groups. Celia Faber took up the cudgels, reminding the panel that many distinguished scientists are questioning HIV. If, would you refer to Dr. Mullis, who was one of your colleagues, as mentally unstable, which is what you actually did? If you were not aware of this, now that you are, have been made aware of it, would you consider an apology? It really was remarkably hard to have any impact. Seasoned journalists like Neville Hodgkinson, highly respected as medical and science correspondent for the Sunday Times, had in April 1992 written a front-page article about the AIDS blunder. But Neville explains how difficult it was to challenge such an entrenched orthodoxy. I've been astounded by this because I, I don't think there's ever been a, a story that I've been given the opportunity to put so much work in on and in which we've so challenged the way that conventional scientists are thinking and arguing about something. Having worked as a medical journalist myself for many years, I, I think that maybe you, you sort of start to identify with doctors and think that it, it's somehow irresponsible to say something that doctors don't say and therefore you go along with it. But that's bad science. The consequences of this clampdown on any questioning of the HIV-AIDS hypothesis have been very serious. Um, it's meant that, above all, the prolongation of errors that should have been picked up, um, and many scientists actually over the years have raised questions. Jad Adams, author of AIDS, the HIV Myth, when he addressed the AZT on trial conference in London in the summer of 1993, echoed the frustration at the censorship and hostility surrounding any challenge to the infectious hypothesis. I've never done a story in which there was so much resistance to the story being told. There's resistance even to the reporting of views by dissidents, even to the reporting of the fact that there are dissidents. Germany has an important place in the history of dissidents because one of the earliest campaigners in Europe was Carvi Schneider. Our leaflets uh, have headlines like HIV is good for you, condoms are dangerous, or condoms equal death. And we explain the scientific issues, why HIV is an absolutely harmless virus, and why the causes of the diseases they are calling AIDS at the moment are different ones, rather than viral or infectious ones. In Switzerland, Felix de Vries, Michael Baumgartner, Heinrich Kramer and the late Professor Alfred Hessig of the Bern Study Group made important contributions. AIDS is certainly not a response to an infectious agent, the HIV virus. Primarily, it's a stress response with persistent formation within the body of inflammatory substances which, if they don't stop and go on in formation, lead to death. link from Perth, Western Australia, with views on the non-isolation of HIV from the Perth group. The, the most important thing that we feel we have done is, is to present good science. Sure, certainly it's been cautious, it's been somewhat slow, although that has been partly generated by the editors and journals who do not like to publish data which is against the current dogma. During this time, the dissident groups were lodged at one of Geneva's best appointed nuclear bunkers. Look at them, look at the hands and the rainbows and the... And it's outrageous because this is the most powerful industry on the planet, is the pharmaceutical industry. And the idea that they would 
that they would put out these kinds of images as if they're all touchy-feely, as if they're a bunch of sort of hippies or something, as if what they're about is love and compassion. I mean, it's disgusting and outrageous. It'd be funny if it weren't so tragic. I mean, AZT is, is a debacle well known to all of us, but now it's happening with protease inhibitors and cocktails. I mean, if you're lucky, you get raging diarrhea only. People in the States now, I don't know if this is happening in Europe as well, but I'm sure it is. The latest thing is um, these humpbacks, where they're getting these bizarre, um, the drugs are causing metabolic disorders, so they're getting very bizarre fatty deposits and these big humps on their backs that are so big that they can't even move their heads and paunches like this and the women's breasts are coming out to here and they're going up from like 10 dress sizes. Literally, just insane mutations of the body. AIDS itself, the, the whole way it's being presented is actually pornographic in, in the broadest sense of the word, meaning there, there's really no respect for, for humanity. I mean, you know, sex is completely taken out of the realm of any feeling or any ten tenderness. I was diagnosed so HIV positive uh, nine years ago. I always went, I never tried any medicine because I, I was strong from the beginning. I didn't want to take any toxic drugs, official toxic drugs. And it worked very well. I never developed any disease or anything. I, I've seen many friends who took it dying. And I got the strong belief that this is just a social madness. After the press conference, Hugh Christie tackled Robert Gallo about the HIV test and why a version called Western Blot is being used as a confirmatory test in the United States when it's been dropped in England by the Public Health Laboratory Services because of its unreliability. Sometimes we had Western blood positive where we couldn't isolate the virus. So we got worried and felt that we're getting false positives sometimes, so we added the Western blood. So it was, a, it was an experimental tool when we added it. And for us, it worked well because we could isolate the virus when we did. Well, what would you say to those people then who did that um, on, on the Saturday, uh, Sunday night? Uh, I mean, I just tell us what the, the right criteria for isolation should be. I mean, like, you're isolated in culture, you take blood cells and you co cultivate with another cell, you transmit it and show that the virus is transmitted. If you want, you can spend a lot of fortune and take electron microscopic pictures, which we did at the beginning, and which other labs did at the beginning. Which are hundreds of those? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. There's, I would say by now thousands of pictures of HIV. So I know which way you're barking, and I know well, that therefore you're a Duisburgite. No, I don't you know hear. what I've heard. All you know is what I've heard. Yeah, well, you've heard it, but why would you be interested in this nonsense? Okay? Because, because we dropped the Western blot. Once material, you picture, once you... Banded material, 1.16. Well, you can look at banded material. It's obvious retrovirus. Do you know what retrovirus looks like? Well, if, if it's you, 1.16... Now you're talking to started. me like you said you didn't understand before. Now you understand. I'm a quick learner. Keep going. Well, well, no, I didn't tell you anything about 1.16. I was there Saturday, Sunday night. It doesn't have to be banded in 116 to take a picture. Okay. Anybody can oh. see a retrovirus and tell. Oh. You banded it at the beginning because you concentrated. And if it has a density of 1.9, say that ain't a retrovirus, you've got lead in your pants. Okay? Failure to isolate virus particles directly from patients with AIDS or at risk of AIDS means the theory that the syndrome is caused by what we're told is HIV remains unproven to this day. The question on everybody's lips was, so if HIV doesn't cause AIDS, what about Africa? As we've shown, in the early 1980s, AIDS was a syndrome that affected young men mainly in urban areas of the west and east coasts of the United States. The risk groups were originally known as the four H's, heroin users, hemophiliacs, homosexuals, and Haitians, because to be Haitian was in itself an official AIDS risk, until the Haitian president complained to the US government. But the official number of AIDS-defining conditions, as decreed by the US Centers for Disease Control, increased from the original two, Kaposi sarcoma skin lesions and the quasi-fungal pneumonia, called PCP, to a total of 27 different conditions. They include candidiasis, cervical cancer, tuberculosis, recurrent pneumonia, and wasting syndrome. 
So when more and more people presenting with these known conditions tested HIV antibody positive, then more and more people joined the ranks of those diagnosed with AIDS, or the more convenient newly coined condition, which helped bump up statistics, HIV disease. But poverty, malnutrition and dirty water remain the greatest cause of disease and death today. In Africa, almost 50% of the population has no access to clean drinking water. It, it means the people have get their water from a dirty water hole. And by definition, the water holes are deeper than the surrounding environment. So by definition, if an animal drinks uh, from water and defecates at the same time, the feces will end up in the water. They will run down in the water. TB was originally only an AIDS-defining condition when it occurred outside the lung, extrapulmonary. But when TB of the lung was included, it hugely increased the number of AIDS cases in Africa. In addition, the WHO's Bangui clinical case definition had decreed that you could be called an AIDS case without an HIV test if you had symptoms like a dry cough and fever for a month. This meant that TB patients were sometimes taken out of TB wards and put into AIDS wards, and given toxic antivirals instead of TB drugs. This relabeling worried TB experts in Africa, like Dr. Martin or Cotton Wang. A patient who has TB and is HIV positive would appear exactly the same as a patient who has TB and is HIV negative. Uh, clinically, both patients could present with a prolonged fever, both patients present with a loss of weight, marked loss of weight, actually. Uh, both patients would uh, present with um, a prolonged cough. And in both cases, the cough could equally be productive. So this is just another proof that what has taken place in Africa is just a relabeling of pre-existing old and mostly preventable diseases, which most of them are poverty related. And so the real scandal in AIDS in Africa is that the West, instead of investing uh, in uh, overcoming poverty, investing to help people to lead better lives and get healthier. So instead of doing this very sensible uh, approach, the West tries to sell toxic drugs and useless HIV tests. The more the flames of plague terror were fanned, the more the money was poured into research focusing on the virus AIDS hypothesis. A frenzy of testing, drugs and condom distribution took place in Africa, where statistics from a few maternity clinics were extrapolated into grossly inflated figures for so-called HIV infection. Estimates that were then spread around the world by the World Health Organization and UNAIDS. In 1993, we went to Africa on a research trip and were later commissioned by Channel 4's dispatches to make the documentary AIDS and Africa. We filmed in Uganda, Tanzania, Cameroon and Côte d'Ivoire. Everywhere we went, we met with poverty, malnutrition and contaminated water supplies. Nowhere was it possible to compare figures for deaths before and after HIV appeared on the scene. Deaths were simply not reported, particularly in the rural areas, and records not kept. People are trying to make a way of living out of this. You know, they, they think that if they publicize it and they exaggerate, they might win sympathy of the international community and get aid, or rather get assistance from the... We need assistance, but not through the other way. I mean, not through bluffing people, that the people are dying at the rate which is not... Jemba's village, the total breakdown of the health and medical services is only too apparent. We visited the local hospital in this so-called epicenter of AIDS and found a sorry scene. Not a single AIDS patient, only an empty ward. No nurses, no doctors, only one tiny baby suffering from malaria convulsions, surrounded by her silent family. 
we then found the only member of staff who got up from her sickbed to speak to us. I work as a midwife. And uh, I also help in the treatment of other patients. How do you feel? Now I'm sick. What do you have? I have malaria. Lack of staff and medicines at these local hospitals and dispensaries has meant that sick people simply stay in their own homes. From both my literature review and my personal experience over most of the AIDS, so-called AIDS centers in Africa, I can find absolutely no believable, persuasive evidence that Africa is in the midst of a new epidemic of infectious immunodeficiency. International African AIDS Conference held in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Here, the emphasis is almost exclusively on controlling AIDS by controlling the sexual spread of HIV. Okay, you see there's a tank. This is a tank where the sperm will remain after ejaculation. You hold like this, and gently it goes down. Make sure this one, you press the, the tank gently. And there it is. The focus on the sexual transmission of AIDS and the hasty and misguided use of HIV tests, originally developed to screen blood products and not for diagnosis, led to an epidemic of mistaken diagnoses in Africa with massive accompanying stigma. This has affected the lives of millions, including young Lucy. Diagnosed HIV positive through a screening test, she was shunned by her community. Philip Creenan and his wife, working for the French charity Partage, helped Lucy to health and confidence. It's very seldom you see people who have been stigmatized with AIDS who are not dying a few months later. So Lucy was one of the first persons who, because we didn't support the AIDS, tag on her, recovered and was the proof to the community that you can recover for, from such episodes. What would you like to see happen? In three successive tests, Lucy has now been found to be HIV negative. It was now time to further investigate the HIV test. After all, to this day, HIV has never been found directly in human blood. It's claimed to be identified through indirect markers, antibodies to a set of proteins believed but never proved to be specific to it, and strips of genetic material believed to belong to it, the so-called viral load test. Multiple cross-reactions with other conditions and inconsistencies between one test kit and another were already providing strong indications that something was seriously wrong. Given the death sentence attached to an HIV-positive diagnosis, we decided to conduct our own experiment to investigate the reliability of the HIV test. The reference laboratories for University College London's medical school processed our blood samples. David Lloyd at Channel 4 agreed to give us development money. We consulted the Perth group about finding our blood samples. They knew that people with inflammatory autoimmune conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis could produce high protein levels in their blood called hypergamma globulinemia, which could result in a positive HIV test. 
They also knew that antibodies generated by TB, candidiasis, malaria, and as many as 70 conditions, including even pregnancy and flu vaccinations, could trigger positive results, as could the blood of IV drug users and alcoholics with hepatitis. University College London's medical school helped fly our TB and malaria blood samples from Africa and provided our lupus samples. We also included blood samples from five volunteers who had tested antibody positive in the past and one gay man, Peter Nichols, who feared he could be positive because of multiple partner risk activity. Peter's conflicting test results were to prove the most astonishing of all. In this exercise, we had 26 blood samples. At the time, there were 20 competing commercial test kits on the market. We chose three well-known ones. For absolute objectivity, we asked Dr Andrew Taylor of the Robens Institute's laboratory at Surrey University to coordinate our sample testing. At that stage, we didn't know which reference laboratory he would choose to perform the HIV ELISA antibody test. Dr Taylor code-numbered the samples on the first run and then to blind the study further, gave a second batch of the same blood samples a new number for a second run. After being sent to University College London's virus laboratory, we received the results from two of the test kits. These were consistent and unsurprising. But what about the third test kit? When these results were finally sent to us, we discovered that 19 of the 26 blood samples, including patients with TB and malaria that had tested negative before, had now tested indeterminate. That's in the grey area, or no man's land, between negative and positive. Some of them were on the verge of positive. Laboratory guidelines state that these should be retested. In a different test sequence, we asked St George's Hospital Tooting's Protein Research Laboratory for four anonymous samples of blood from patients with generally high blood protein levels, IgG and IgM, but with no AIDS-defining diseases. We sent these to a central London private testing laboratory. One of the four tested definitely HIV antibody positive. Remember, these were patients who had no AIDS-defining conditions. We then went back to our first test sequence and followed up on our volunteer Peter Nichols' results. He had tested antibody positive on all three test kits through our Robin's UCL experiment. We took him to two London teaching hospitals, St Mary's in Paddington and the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead. He tested negative at both. How did he feel? Confused in a way, obviously glad that now, um, having received two sets of negative results, I'm obviously fairly confident that I'm HIV negative now. Um, but confused as to why I would receive a positive result in the first place from the experiment that we did. Um, and how many other false positive results are there floating around that people don't know about? We continued with our quest. It was usual for a positive ELISA test to be confirmed with a Western blot test. Dr Philip Mortimer, then head of the Government Public Health Laboratory Services, or PHLS, had been concerned about the reliability of the Western blot test. He recommended a double ELISA and dropping the Western blot. So the Western blot was dropped in England and Wales, but in Scotland it continued to be a requirement. We gathered 16 blood samples and had them tested in England with a double ELISA and in Scotland using the Western blot. The results were remarkable. 12 of the 16 samples were declared negative in England, but one of those was definitely positive in Scotland and another five were equivocal or borderline. So of our total of 42 blood tests, 25 over half produce contradictory or anomalous results. How many more of these cases might there be? How much agony and how many suicides have followed these mistaken death sentences? We were excited about putting all our research, £17,000 worth of development money from Channel 4, into a one-hour special for World AIDS Day 1998.
But to our utter dismay, it was cancelled. There'd been a change of schedule. Maybe we'd like to do a short report for Channel 4 News about the Geneva World AIDS Conference instead? We did. Hugh Christie and I were commissioned and made our report. We covered the fact that a pre-conference satellite link-up had taken place where the Perth group had strongly criticised the validity of the HIV test and raised the issue of the lack of evidence for the purification and isolation of HIV. Our report for Channel 4 News reached its final stages, an approved fourth draft script, an approved press release and transmission date. But four days before transmission, the editor Jim Gray called us in and said he'd had a tectonic shift and would not be transmitting the programme. On World AIDS Day, we organised a picket line outside Channel 4 News denouncing the censorship. Our anger mounted as we learned of the way Western pharmaceutical companies and the media were targeting President Thabo Mbeki in South Africa and his stand against the distribution of potentially toxic antiretroviral drugs to pregnant women who had tested antibody positive. Journalist Anita Allen helped arrange for Hugh Christie and me to fly out to Johannesburg and interview the president on film at Government House in Pretoria. The night we arrived, we met with senior members of the African National Congress at Anita's home. We had Snatsu Manyama, ANC head of the presidency and communications, a wonderful man, just wonderful. And he was very, very impressed. And he left, when he left, he said, I am invigorated. I'm taking your energy with me to the president. It was almost impossible for me to believe that we were really going to be favoured with, and it is favoured with, an interview with the president. And there came a moment when we were told that we had been selected. <laughs> Last year, you were reported as saying in Parliament that you were concerned about the giving of AZT to pregnant mothers. Uh, why were you concerned? Well, because uh, uh, lots of questions had been raised around the question of the, of the toxicity of the drug. Um, it was very serious. We have a responsibility as a government to determine matters of public health. And, uh, and therefore, we can take decisions, we have to take decisions that impact directly on, on human beings. And it seemed to me that where doubts had been raised, questions had been raised around these toxicity questions, uh, uh, and the efficacy even uh, of, of, this, of AZT uh, and other drugs, that it was necessary again to go into these matters because uh, it wouldn't sit easily on one's conscience to discover that you had been warned that there could be danger. And nevertheless, you went ahead and said, uh, despite the danger, let's dispense these drugs. I feel on the cusp of excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the TV program is looking great. It's, am it's amazingly beautiful in places. And it has some very disturbing information. And it's going to be seen by many people who need to see it right, right in this region. The programme was transmitted in 42 countries across Africa by Mnet South Africa on their weekly current affairs programme, Carte Blanche. But no Western channels would touch it. A few months later, President Mbeki convened a presidential advisory panel on AIDS in Pretoria involving dissident and orthodox scientists from around the world. It was a big event. Yeah, I uh, was invited by President Mbeki because he has uh, concerns about the toxicity of ACT. 
and uh, I'm an oncologic physician and I saw a lot of patients dying in the early 90s and the late 80s which all had the high dose regime of ACT and ACT is a cancer drug and it's just a question of time when the bone marrow will be completely suppressed. The problem is that physicians are not aware of the problem because they think that AIDS patients have to die, so they were not very astonished that they did as was told. But if you look at the detrimental effect of ACT, it's very easy to understand because ACT is a cell-killing substance and we wouldn't use this in oncology because we know about the bone marrow suppression, so we would stop to give the bone marrow time for recovery. But in AIDS patients, the situation is different. They get it as a lifelong treatment and nobody can survive this treatment. So we reached consensus yesterday here that we killed people with ACT. It's just the question, how many did we kill? I was seized by this irresistible moral and political imperative to act, to do something. I just, it was like, I just couldn't turn away, it was like turning away from somebody drowning. Walking away from the scene of a murder. I think it's a bad thing. I think that people are being killed by this uh, terrible drug and uh, people are being sort of, you know, shepherding people into barbed wire concentration camps physically is one thing, but also, you know, you can do it mentally too. You, know, you can drive people to their deaths by terrifying them to death. At the end of the gathering, anti-apartheid veteran Dr. Sam Hlongo, who was in charge of family health in South Africa and a strong supporter of the president on issues surrounding AIDS, summed it up like this. I think uh, it is worthwhile to look into questions what is making black Africans so sick in Africa uh, when uh, their counterparts in Europe heterosexuals I'm talking about, are not even uh, half as sick. So we will have to look at this and see wh what is making Africans sick. It cannot be, in my view, no one has uh, convinced me that HIV is what is making them sick. I am as confident as I was when I left South Africa in 1963 that uh, uh, one day we will defeat apartheid. I feel AIDS, and I'm, I'm not talking about HIV, AIDS will be defeated in Africa just as much as uh, serious infectious diseases were defeated in Europe. Over the years that followed, a successful strategy of silence has been employed by the media hand in hand with the scientific and pharmaceutical establishments. Any debate challenging the virus AIDS hypothesis was carried out at various dissident conferences around the world. In early 2000, the number of young intravenous drug users in Russia was escalating at an alarming rate, and many were testing HIV antibody positive. Uh, now we give the word to Nadezhda Khramova for the first uh, presentation of our conference. Uh, 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 members of the All Russia Parents Forum, including members of the Russian Orthodox Church, became concerned that huge amounts of money were pouring into the country, much of it for so-called safe sex education programs, often involving drama groups from Western Europe, enacting simulated sex and condom use in front of children as young as seven. The forum convened a conference in Ekaterinburg, a city in eastern Russia in the Urals, to extend a hand to the dissident scientists. Anthony Brink was one of the key coordinators with Western countries. Hello and thank you for being here for so long today. 
Christine Maggiore offered reassurance and support at the conference to young mothers who, because of their positive status, were being forced into taking toxic antiviral drugs and told not to breastfeed or their children would be taken into care. Christine, who ran a well-known dissident pressure group, Alive and Well, had had conflicting positive and negative HIV test results over the years. In Russia, she was healthy and well, and full of plans for the future. But a few months later, she developed pneumonia and died. Although her critics insist this was caused by her opposition to taking antiretroviral drugs, the independent report by toxicologist and pathologist Dr. Mohamed Al-Bayati said her death was caused by renal failure, resulting from the effects of the administration of three powerful antibiotics in the nine days prior to her death. Once plague terror has set in with all its financial implications, it becomes almost impossible for the scientific establishment to change course. It, I think if you, if you started interviewing uh, all of the scientists in those laboratories, you'd find out that there's a lot of doubt out there. They're just publicly, they're afraid to speak up because they'll be punished. They will lose their grants. Um, they will lose their jobs. Uh, science in America, has be, at least aid science, is really religion. And if you dare challenge authority, you lose your livelihood. That's the way science works. It, it, it indicates that science has turned into something like a religion, where opinions are perceived to be a threat if they don't follow the, the currently held beliefs and if they don't represent political correctness. This voguish commitment to political correctness surrounding a flawed scientific model has had a devastating effect on our own spontaneity and sexual behaviour. It condemned a generation to, to a kind of contaminated idea of sex, that sex was any kind of sex, uh, unless it was kind of between two virgins, was going to carry a risk of, of picking up this deadly virus. So they're unlimited, the consequences, plus the hundreds of billions that have gone into a faulty hypothesis, a great tragedy. Because in 1997, I was diagnosed as HIV positive. That's my case and my story. But we're now 2009. I want to know what you guys are going to tell those people to question the doctors, to ask these questions that we're all talking about here, which is quite a very luxurious position to be in. But I really don't think sex has to do with it. Clean water has to do with it. I think we were giving an example all over the planet of a unit, the different how, for instance, Etienne has different views to Peter, and we have different views, but we are united. The HIV-AIDS orthodoxy in Africa depends on a behavior modification paradigm, or a promiscuity paradigm, wedded to obsessions about poor black people's sexual behavior, while downplaying the political economy of poverty, sickness, and disease. Their statistical sophistry, data manipulation, and voodoo math enrage me. It is estimated that there are new HIV infections, uh, six new HIV infections uh, for 100,000 residents per year. But let's look at something that we can measure, AIDS-related deaths. Professor Marco Ruggiero stunned his audience by showing that according to Italy's Ministry of Health, AIDS isn't a statistically relevant disease. But let's go to my beautiful region, Tuscany where Dante used to live. In Tuscany, we have a good control of statistics and a, a good epidemiological unit. And so you can read that in Tuscany, there have been seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven deaths in 2005, and four deaths in 2006. And Tuscany has a population of more than three million people. So you can clearly see that it is not a relevant problem at all. Writer and journalist Tony Lance told the audience how, by the mid-90s, 100 of his friends and acquaintances had died. 
Tony put forward his theory of intestinal dysbiosis. He points to gay sexual practices like rectal douching and sexual lubricants that can affect the flora in the colon and create a reaction in the gut, making it more permeable and less able to resist invading microbes. The ecosystem in your gut is a rainforest, rich in species and inter interdependencies. These activities, antibiotics, rectal douching, and the use of lubricants are the equivalent of coming in, uh, of loggers coming in and cutting down all the trees. That's what's happening. And these are not uncommon practices among gay men. So I, I want to talk about um, uh, some of the legal cases that I've learned about. Some I've been involved David Crow spoke movingly about the legal cases he'd been helping with, which involve HIV-positive men and women imprisoned for aggravated sexual assault, assault with a deadly weapon, HIV, and first-degree murder. A death that occurs uh, during Aggravated sexual assault in Canada is automatic first-degree murder with no evidence of intent. Most harsh of all was Johnson Azika, the only man to my knowledge to receive a, a conviction for first-degree murder merely for being HIV positive. Uh, he had a number of girlfriends over the years. Two of them were found to be HIV positive, took AIDS drugs and died of an acknowledged side effect of uh, ACT, known as non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Luckily, Canada does not have the, have the death penalty, or he might have been the first person executed for being HIV positive. It's, it's very upsetting for me to see people's children being ripped away from them. I've been involved in many such cases. It's very difficult for me to see people being sent to jail for 10, 20 years. I'm sorry to say that very little has changed in the past 20 years. If anything, the positions on both sides that, that HIV and nothing else causes AIDS on one side and on the other side HIV has nothing at all to do with AIDS, if anything, those positions have become more entrenched. And that's a very great shame because there's an awful lot of middle ground uh, and areas which would be of tremendous benefit to the public generally, to science and of course to patients. The summer of 2010 saw the dissident conference AIDS Qui Bono in Vienna at the same time as the World AIDS Conference. Two Viennese doctors, Christian Fiala and Uta Santos Koenig, spearheaded the conference. Peter Duisberg reminded us that censorship in the corridors of medical power is on the increase. He highlighted a paper he'd co-authored for medical hypotheses. The paper was published on the journal's website and then abruptly withdrawn and the journal's editor dismissed. Unfortunately, this article was censored, withdrawn, with the argument that uh, the ideas presented in this article posed a potential threat to global public health. The satellite channel Russia Today decided to give the dissident conference a voice and in between their reporting of the orthodox conference interviewed a dissident a day. This was unprecedented. Using bad science to prop up a questionable theory in order to protect financial interests is well known. But when the bad science becomes so entrenched that the voice of the independent scientist can no longer be heard, and when the perpetrators of this bad science can dominate the distribution of research worldwide, then one begins to despair. So what we need to understand is that science is not truth. It is one system, one belief system that helps us to understand reality. And like any other belief system, it has mistakes and we need to understand the functioning and try to make the best out of it without taking it for the absolute truth. The anger comes when I then think about the people who are dying because this is not is not a, a question of simply pushing through the research to convince other scientists. This is a question that every month that goes by we have several hundreds or thousands of people who died who might have been able to be helped if only we had gotten the research done earlier or convinced more people to move in this direction. 
it's a it's a very worrying thing that anybody can say today in today's world that there is a point of view that is prohibited that's banned that there are heretics who must be bent at the stake and it's all said in the name of science and health can't be right how had Peter Duesberg felt all those years before when he first challenged the AIDS establishment? A bit like Galileo must have felt when he ended up in prison. Probably somewhat satisfied that nobody could prove him wrong, but also saddened that he didn't get a forum, and in the case of AIDS, that 150,000 people have since developed AIDS in this country Many of them could have been saved. The unresolved mystery of AIDS, the numerous predictions that have so patently failed to materialize, linger on as challenges to the scientific community. We've gathered the information you've just seen over a period of 25 years, yet nothing has changed. People are still led to believe that being HIV positive means you've fallen victim to a deadly infection. The textbooks tell us so. It may take a generation for the truth to out. <laughs>